a lot of my work is on how we need uh, viewpoint diversity, we need people to challenge us to make us smarter. And I think this format, rather than a formal debate, to, to bring people who've been writing about this together in a, in a collegial way, to, to, who probably are gonna take opposite views on many things, I think is a productive and, and really enjoyable uh, format. So thank you to IQ Squared and to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, the, the, there are two related problems that have, uh, that have sort of flooded into the United States or become very visible in the last three or four years. They weren't really visible before then. Uh, so I'll just very briefly state them and that I hope will set us up for a discussion. Uh, the first is that we have, um, I'd say, a, a mental health crisis for boys and a mental health catastrophe for girls. What I mean by that is that rates of anxiety and depression were fairly stable uh, in the early, from 2000 to 2010, and then they begin rising very sharply. Um, for boys, rates of major depression are up about uh, 30%. For girls, they're up about 40%. Some people say this is just self-report, it's not real. Um, but rates of hospital admission for self-harm are up in the same way for girls, not for boys, though. Um, for suicide in the United States, Suicide for teenage boys is up 25% from the first decade of the century if you look at the rise to the last two or three years. 25% increase. For girls, it's 70%, 70 percent increase. I just looked at the numbers for the UK on my way over here. The Guardian has had a lot of really good coverage of the various studies that have come out. It's the exact same thing. You too have no rise at all in hospital admissions for boys. Boys are not cutting themselves more, but your girls are going to the hospital much more because they cut their bodies and are bleeding. Um, you also have, even though the suicide rate, I think it was in England and Wales, even though that suicide rate is going down to historic levels overall, the rate for teenage girls has reached its highest level ever. You also have about a 60 or 65% increase in, in completed suicides for English, uh, English girls, English and Welsh girls. So there's a mental health catastrophe going on. Uh, we don't really know what causes it, but the best, the, the, the most likely explanations are the combination of social media, which is much harder on girls than boys, and the vast, vast overprotection that we, in, in the United States, um, we decided to stop letting our kids out, to tell them the world is dangerous, to tell them that if they're ever not watched by an adult, they will be abducted. We started telling them this in the 1980s, and especially in the 1990s, just as our crime rate was plummeting. We taught them that life is so dangerous that they shouldn't be allowed outside. We deprived them of free play. So we don't know for sure, but we have a mental health crisis. It begins with kids born in 1995. We call them Gen Z, or Gen Z, you would say, or, the, or iGen for the internet generation. So when this generation arrives on campus, in the United States, that's around age 18, they come to the university. So in, 19, in 2013, they first, the first members of, of Gen Z, Gen Z, come to campus. And that's when all of these things start. None of us had heard of these terms, practically. But by 2014, in a few schools, students were asking for protections from words, books, speakers, ideas. They were treating them as though they were dangerous. Of course students can protest and have protested words, books, speakers, and ideas, but they never before said, if this is presented, if this person comes, I or someone will be traumatized, harmed, damaged. This was new. We call this in the book, uh, Greg Lukianoff and I call it um, safetyism, the, the worship of safety, the, the, uh, the, the view of the world as safe versus dangerous. Americans now, young Americans talk about emotional safety. We used to call it emotional discomfort. Socrates reveled in creating emotional discomfort on the way to learning. Um, many of us are, are reluctant to do that now because if I create emotional discomfort in my students, they might take that as that they're unsafe and there's a number to call, there's an email to call to report me, even from class, they can report me if they think I've made them unsafe. Sorry, Jonathan, just a comment. You have actually changed the way you teach yes. because of your own worries. Yes, I used to be a provocative teacher. I do not provoke anymore. I just play it straight. I don't tell jokes. I don't show many videos. Because it's happened to you personally? Yes. It happens to a lot of people. So we all share stories. When I started this in 2015, people thought that we were exaggerating, we're talk talking about a few anecdotes, because it was just starting then. Now it has spread so far that even though most students are fine, most students are not depressed, they want to learn, they want to be exposed, but if you have a class of 300 students, you now have to teach to the most sensitive student because any one of them can report you.
Give us an example of how you think this is manifesting itself on campuses in the US. What, what have you actually seen in concrete terms? Um, so, um, let's see, what, what have I seen? So, we're very careful about exploring hypotheses that could be taken as contrary to received wisdom on politically sensitive topics. Let's take gender, for example. Um, so, it's commonly said that women earn 70% as much as men. Um, now, that's a true fact in the United States, but that doesn't account for hours worked or job picked. If you correct for those, then we're up in the 90s. Um, but it sounds better to say that women are only paid 70% as much as men for the same work. Any social scientist knows that's a meaningless statistic unless you equate for the kind of job and the hours worked. But I have seen social scientists, I've seen people say this from the stage, that women are only paid 70% as much, and I've seen an, another social scientist who know that that's not true, won't say anything because you don't want to be called sexist, you don't want to be seen as challenging, as somehow denying or minimizing the problem. And at what point do you think the students have the upper hand? Do you think that students now dictate what is being taught and what is being said on campuses? Well, you have to think about it in terms of everybody is making a calculation as they walk through. We're, we're all caught in a minefield. We're all walking through a world in which one word we say, and this is true for everybody, faculty, students, everybody, one, one word, one thing you say can be misreported or properly reported on Twitter and it blows up into something. So this, we're all stuck in this, and this is one of the reasons for the mental health crisis. Um, what we know from surveys that we've conducted, uh, I, I run an organization, or used to, called Heterodox Academy, we've surveyed students. What we know is that they are afraid to speak up in class, or many of them report that they self-censor, mostly because they're afraid of other students. Professors are mostly afraid of other students. The students, again, Gen Z, which grew up with the ability to block things that they don't want, block people they don't want. They're very adept at social media. And so what's happened is we don't trust each other. Um, we don't, we, it's very difficult for professors to trust their students. We can trust most of them, but that's not enough. You talk about anti-fragility. Yes. Now, I know that's a, a phrase that goes up um, back to, I think it's Nassim Taleb, isn't it? But you use this phrase, anti-fragility, to talk about um, an inability to have resilience. Yes, this is the most important concept in the book, and so I'll just, I can lay it out very quickly, and if we, if we, all, if we have this on the table, everything else will make more sense. So many things, this, you know, this glass is fragile, and if I drop it, it will break, and it won't be better, it will be broken. And so we give kids plastic cups because plastic is resilient. But if a kid drops a plastic cup, it doesn't get better. There are a few things that need to be dropped. There are a few things that have to be challenged in order to configure themselves. So the immune system is the best example. If you protect your kids from bacteria and peanuts, they will have more autoimmune diseases and more likely to have peanut allergies. So the immune system requires exposure to all sorts of things. Well, it turns out human beings are anti-fragile. Human beings require, we, we have to experience stress, exclusion, teasing, insults. We have to experience these things in small doses as kids to set the social system that allows it to wire itself up so that we can face larger things by the time we're adults. In the United States now, we have gone so far towards protecting kids. My daughter, when she was in third grade last year in New York City public schools, the girls would form play groups on the playground, and hers was the Kitty Cat Club, and only members of the Kitty Cat Club could hang out in a certain place. And so the teacher said, well, you know, she led them through why we can't exclude people, it's wrong to exclude people. Well, okay, it's a good discussion to have, but if my daughter were to go all the way through schooling without having those experiences when she gets to college, she won't be able to handle small things. That's what we think is happening. Kids are actually anti-fragile in the United States and in Britain. You've been raising kids as though they're fragile. One of your head teachers recently banned snowball fights because what if someone gets hit in the eye? If we protect kids from small risks, they don't learn how to face larger risks. And I'm going to pick up with Eleanor now. Um, <laughs> lucky you. You're, you're our representative. I'm the token snowflake. <laughs> you are, what do you prefer? iGen or Zen, Gen Z or you choose. Oh, you can call me a snowflake if you want. I reserve that for my closest well, friends. Um, let, let's talk about um, the things that Jonathan has just mentioned there. Stress, exclusion, insults, teasing. Do you feel that those are areas that you should try and protect young people from? Or did you actually agree with most of what he said? 
Well, I think that um, what Jonathan's questions, um, Jonathan's questions um, attempt to essentially frame what is a political problem as a problem that be can be reduced to and solved on the level of like personal psychological robustness. And I think that movement is something that is inherently flawed because what we're facing now is a series of overlapping political crises that students on campuses across the country, across the world, are attempting to develop frameworks and epistemological tactics and organizational tactics in order to change that. And yes, sometimes those look uncomfortable to the kind of columnists who are triggered enough to write an article about how they don't have a platform in a national newspaper. However, um, I think we're in danger of um, calling the people pointing out the problem, the problem. We're in danger of massively misdiagnosing the real existential threats to our freedom of speech, which do exist, but they don't look like the very overblown handful of cases of students on campus um, overusing tactics such as, you know, such as no platforming or uh, such as trigger warnings. They look like, you know, the mass surveillance that's going on in our society. They look like um, government collecting data on Muslim students through uh, prevent legislation. They look like the rise and rise of the far right who have explicitly mobilized around uh, things like shutting down free speech. They like to play victims and they like to uh, spin a narrative of martyrdom, but really, um, as, the, uh, as Donald Trump has shown us, uh, they have very little interest in, uh, in the game that we think, they, uh, we think we're playing. They have no interest in civility, they have no interest in truth, and they have no interest in freedom of speech. And what we're in danger of doing here, and I use that word purposely, don't worry, um, <laughs> is having exactly the kind of concept creep that you talk about in the book, right? From freedom of speech as um, freedom from prosecution and freedom from harm uh, when you voice your opinion to a kind of freedom from consequence. So what we're expected is that powerful uh, speakers, often uh, powerful right-wing men, are um, expected to be invited along to very prestigious platforms to air their views and uh, not be challenged for it. And to me, that's not, uh, that's not free speech, it's, it's the exact opposite. It's using uh, free speech, uh, it's using the trappings of free speech to essentially um, protect people who are already powerful from being challenged. It's, a, it's essentially flaying alive one of the mo most fundamental rights in our democracy and you know, wearing its dead skin. <laughs> so Eleanor, I'm gonna come in here because you, um, you're making, it, these are really, important points, I think. Now, I wouldn't have gone straight for no platforming because I think that's probably exactly the area that you think people push this debate onto when it's, if you like, the pinnacle of it. But since you are doing that and you're talking about the far right, let's put some examples here. Mm -hmm. um, the obvious one is Steve Bannon, who was in Oxford talking at the Union. Um, so in that situation, you would not want Steve Bannon anywhere near your university. Well, I think that, um, well, first of all, my university, um, uh, UCL, represent, um, has an inglorious history of um, things like uh, white supremacist conferences, eugenics, uh, that kind of thing. So the university in and of itself isn't this kind of like sanctified repository of, uh, of knowledge that cannot be, uh, that is apolitical and cannot be questioned. They are cultural institutions, they live in our society, they are as flawed and as struggling and as in evolution as the rest of us, right? Um, but I think what we need to, uh, need to understand is that the university as a cultural institution also conveys a stamp of approval. And that is a stamp of approval that I don't want to see given to someone who has no interest in uh, protecting free speech and um, does pose, um, and the politics that he has espoused does pose an existential threat to, you know, me and people like me. I think what we need to remember here is that free speech is fundamentally important because words have an impact. Mm. 
And to say that like, we shouldn't consider the impact of those words in a limited number of cases, such as the, such as the you know, fascism, uh, I think is ludicrous and I think is an under-analysis of the importance of free speech.